really echoes down that canyon. That's awesome. I mean, you can't even get pizza in half these towns. Like, oh. Eureka didn't have a pizza place. Yeah, that's, that's Austin it. didn't have a pizza place. You're stuck with a DuJourno. <laughs> well, I can't even cook that because I'm in a hotel with nobody. <laughs> you know what? All right, well, thanks again for the ride. Appreciate it. I've really got a deadline that I'm trying to meet. Uh, I really need to finish this hike by Friday at 3 p.m. Uh, next week in Great Basin National Park. Well, this is it, final section of the Basin Range Trail. Uh, these temperatures are just, whew, they're hot. It's gonna be 101 degrees today. I've got a 6,000 foot climb ahead of me. Get up to Mount Moriah. And somebody drops you off in the middle of nowhere. And they, uh, they always say, you know, are you gonna be all right? You're not gonna die, are you? I don't wanna hear about you uh, dying of dehydration or something on the news. You know, after two months on trail, I know my body, I know what I'm capable of doing. And uh, just need to survive another week. So that's where I'm headed up that canyon. That's uh, Deerhead Canyon and Necro Creek. And I'll follow that up to an area called The Table, which is just a big flat uh, plot of land uh, right below the summit of uh, Mount Moriah. Now five or six days away from the end now. And it's just a great feeling. You know, you feel a little extra excitement in the air. There's actually a good flowing stream right there. That's a solid, that's a solid water source for the desert. Yeah, I've got six liters on my back, so I might be able to shed a few liters and not carry all that weight up, you know, five, 6,000 feet. And man, this valley is just really choked with all this vegetation. And it's mostly the sagebrush here, which is, you know, extremely common. But then you've got this other brush here called rabbit brush and I've been told it kind of smells like paint, which I guess I could understand, I can kind of smell it. And in uh, World War II, I guess they were looking at this plant because of its high, I guess, latex content, and they were gonna use it as like a rubber alternative or something for tires, uh, but I guess it never came to that. And that's probably the biggest sagebrush I think I've seen on this entire trail. That's like eight feet tall. Actually, it's gotta be taller than that. It's gotta be eight and a half, nine feet tall. And just a minute ago, I was just kind of like in the wide open, I just exposed desert, you know, no trees, and now it's now it's just like a lush forest. Well, good afternoon, ladies. Are you enjoying your uh, graze? And you got a little bit of stuff hanging out of your mouth there, buddy. And I, I plan on continuing walking this road, so. You're probably gonna wanna leave this road if you're gonna wanna avoid me. And that's the first pretty good view I've got of Mount Moriah, which is where I'm ultimately heading today. And that's the first 12,000 foot peak I've come across really on this whole trail. Like this is where the road ends and hopefully it's the beginning of a, a trail. The map shows a road that goes several miles further up than this. I really don't have any desire to do any more bushwhacking. I thought I was done with all that.
spider web in the face. Man, it's like a jungle through here. The trout swimming away. muddy field to cross here. I don't want to lose a shoe. Honestly, I don't even know if this is the way to go. <laughs> kind of lost the trail at this point. Uh, I have no idea if I'm actually on whatever the trail is supposed to be. This has got to be a game trail. Oh. Oh. Backpack's catching on all this branches. Yeah, there's nowhere to cross the stream here, so now pretty much just get my feet wet. Oh wow, a little waterfall. In this area, had a lot of these like, it's like rock outcroppings here. They're kind of like, it's a bunch of like flat rocks stacked on each other. So I've been walking for like three hours now, probably gone five or six miles, something like that. Uh, and then I've got another 3,000 foot of elevation gain in the next three and a half miles. It's just one of those things, I was hoping this would be an easier day. Of course, these are all like, ow, thorn bushes. Can't even really grab them to, maybe I can go underneath them. Ah. Oh man, I swear it's never easy. thorn bushes that snag your legs. Some of these canyons are actually pretty impressive. It's just hidden by the trees, you know? You don't even know you're, don't even know what you're looking at really until the canopy breaks. It's so thick. Yeah, look at these rock formations though. I mean, literally, I mean, really, what a beautiful canyon. Whoa, man, that is cool. I just went around these trees and I didn't really realize the, the depth of these rocks. Oh, wow, and there's actually a cave right there too. This canyon is kind of starting to impress me the more I get into it. It's just, uh, it's just really thick and hard to work your way through, but that's what keeps these places so remote, so hidden, and really so special. Man, this is a big pine. Really big for Nevada. I'd maybe get my arms halfway around this thing. Maybe. Well, this is the last time I'm going to cross this creek here, so I'm going to filter some water before uh, I get up to the high country where more than likely there's not going to be any water. And when I was on the CDT, my friends would uh, kind of make fun of me for putting so much of this drink mix in my, in my drinks, but it says one squirt for eight ounces, and there's 32 ounces in here, so four squirts. So one, two, three, four. Yeah. That's about right. So my one buddy I hiked with, he had one of these that last him to like Wyoming. One bottle. That's nuts. So now I'm headed up the, basically the final leg of this canyon here. And it looks like the trail is thinned out even more. Now I'm just barely following a cow path. Oh great, aspen trees, that's never a good sign. Usually means hard work ahead. I'm a bit surprised to see this creek here, but uh, yeah, here it is. Nice little 
flowing trickle of a creek. And here it is, the source of that creek is like 100 feet upstream here. It's basically just coming out of the, the ground right there. And it's amazing how uh, water just starts trickling out of basically nothing. Almost at the top now. I've been hiking for about six hours. I know I haven't gone more than like 10 or 12 miles. I got the biggest part of the climb done. Still got another like thousand foot to get up to an area called the table. But uh, this is still pretty nice and flat. Mount Mariah Wilderness, here we come. Look at this, we even got a sign. Wow, look at that. <laughs> it's the backside of Mount Mariah. That is impressive. Yeah, it's always nice to be on a legitimate single track trail in Nevada. Just feels like such a rarity. There's a deer. Yep, there he goes. Here's a spring just coming right out of the ground. And this one's not on my map. It's kind of cool to come across these uh, supplemental water sources. Wow. Wow, and these are bristlecone pine trees, literally the oldest living thing on the planet. These trees can live to be over 4,800 years old. So trees of this size have gotta be 1,500 years old, easy. And this guy here is like the T-Rex trees, just like big and fat with these two tiny little stubby arms. And the circumference of this tree is just massive. Look at the size of this thing. Well, this is the table. Pretty flat and open, just like the name implies. Well, it's seven o'clock now. So there's no way I'm gonna summit Mariah tonight. But it looks like there's plenty of great campsites. So I pretty much just take my pick, find one with a nice view, find one that's uh, close to the route up to the summit tomorrow to kind of set myself up real nice for that. This is basically it for the trees up on the table here. And it's hard to believe I'm at 11,000 feet right now. And down there to the east is Snake Valley. And that's looking into Utah. Right there on the horizon, right above the ridge, is a big buck. Oh yeah, there's another one. Honestly, I think it's an elk. This view is absolutely nuts. You wanna talk about just looking out in the middle of nowhere, this is it. Oh, I just spotted a Karen there, Karen there. So there's my use trail, climber's trail that goes up Mount Mariah. So anywhere around here, be fine to camp. We'll see if that doesn't give me a better view of Snake Valley and, and Utah. Wonder how those Utahns are doing tonight. Or as I like to call them, Utites. 
Oh yeah, this will probably be it. You can see somebody's built this little uh, windbreak. But wow, look at that view, man. Woo! Well, camp tonight is at 11,200 feet, which I believe is Maybe one of my highest camps yet, if not the highest uh, so far on the whole Basin and Range Trail. I mean, I just love mornings like this. You know, you just kind of see like this haze in the valley and you just see like layer after layer of mountains. And it's kind of like a foggy morning to me where you just don't know quite what's out there, but Something about it is like mysterious and alluring, you know? Anyways, now it's time to climb up there to Mount Moriah. It's not the true summit, it's actually hidden behind that. What's well, a weird feeling, I almost never do this. Make a base camp, climb a summit, you know, come back to base camp and then pack up and head out for the day. Right above that tree is a herd of, uh, I don't know, deer, antelope, elk, can't quite tell from here, four of them. Hey, what are you? Yeah, now they're on the run. Run, Forrest, run. So there's the animals I saw earlier down there, the herd of four. I think those are bighorn sheep. Just below the summit here at Mount Moriah. Just got the final push to go here. Just a matter of picking your path up to the top. And here it is, the summit block of Mount Moriah, 12,067 feet. Highest I think I've been so far in the BRT. Man, now that is a view. You can see all the forest fire smoke blowing in from California. And over there is Wheeler Peak, second highest peak in Nevada, over 13,000 feet. You can just see it for you know, 100 miles away, 140 miles away. And that's where I started yesterday, was at the very uh, head of that canyon. And that down there is the area called the Table. And that's what I walked across last night right before sunset. So I'll follow this canyon all the way out here, out into Snake Valley, around the south side of Mount Moriah. And then it's time to start heading to Great Basin National Park. Coming for you, Wheeler! And the tread on my shoes is pretty much shot. These shoes are gonna be on their last leg, on their last tread by the time I get done with this hike. Well, I'm really glad I didn't go for the summit last night. Would have just been foolish, really. Didn't have enough time. Whoa. 
Shouldn't be a mystery why my shoes are worn out, huh? Right, here we go. Good. Bunch of sliding. Woo! All right. And just like that, we're back on trail. And there she is. Now it's time to pack up and head downhill. You know, walking these like big open plateaus at high elevation was always sort of a weird feeling for me. Just kind of seeing like the mountain peaks just kind of rise off of these flat plateaus. I gotta say the Mount Moriah area is pretty impressive. And I've heard this Hendry's Creek is pretty nice as well. And the fact that there is a trail, a marked trail, does give me a little bit more hope than uh, the route up through Negro Creek yesterday. And you know, I've gone through so many areas that didn't have any maintenance, didn't have a trail, and really made me want to give a little back after spending so much time here. Uh, so I reached out to the Friends of Nevada Wilderness. You know, they help maintain some of these trails and everything. And uh, fortunately with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic this summer, they've scaled back their volunteer operations and uh, wasn't able to uh, you know, uh, volunteer to do any trail work after I complete the trail. And so I'm hoping sometime in the future I can make it back out to Nevada, volunteer a day or two of my time and just give a little bit back. There haven't been too many places I've hiked in Nevada where you get like a cirque of mountains like this and pretty much down into this canyon which uh, I guess I'll be following for I don't know several miles eight ten miles I guess until I uh, reach the desert once again. You know, these are the kind of places that you don't really think of when you think of Nevada. A heavily forested canyon like this flowing creek and I'm down to a liter, so I might as well stop and filter some water. Man, what a rare experience this is on the BRT. A walking, actual hiking trail downhill, good condition, along a creek with shade. It's about as relaxing as it gets. It's almost like hiking. Oh, this is a little weird. Right off the trail here, there's this cooler. I'm almost afraid to open it. Probably some rotting hamburger in there or something. Uh, well, a rock. Okay then, Let's see why they left it. Cooler full of rock. The creek's definitely getting bigger. I'm still pretty high up. I think this is actually gonna be a fairly sizable stream by the time I reach the end of this canyon. Oh, this is getting pretty cool now. All these rock formations sticking up and kind of getting like hemmed into this narrow canyon. Through hiking is such a unique experience in the sense that, you know, you're basically able to just kind of pick up and leave your existing life as you know it behind for 
you know, a month or two or six months or however long your hike is and just live a, uh, a life that's completely free of all the obligations I think that typically you know, weigh us down and just kind of wear on our minds. The vegetation in this creek is just so thick you can't really get a good look at these canyon walls that often, but man, when you do, you can just see how impressive they are. And the lower I get in this canyon, the more impressive it really is. Wow. I literally can't stop looking up. It's like 95 degrees out and I've got chills. I love it. Just awe-inspiring. This forest fire smoke is blowing in. It kind of creates this like haze it makes it just look like mystical. Well, here's the wilderness sign. I am leaving Mount Moriah Wilderness. Well, unfortunately, the creek has dried up. I was hoping it'd last a little bit longer, like down to the end of the canyon. Now I'm actually quite a ways from my next water source. Well, the creek is back. Should probably fill up with water now while I have the chance. Just enjoying the last bit of shade before it's back out into the desert. Almost out of the Hendry's Creek Canyon here. And you can really tell the landscape's changing now. Pretty much just looks like a barren desert. It's like the last couple patches of trees. I think these are chuckers. That is a huge hatch. Dang. Well done, guys. Well, actually, I'm leaving. I'm not entering. I'm out of Hendry's Creek now. What a different scene this is. And that's Snake Valley down there, looking east out into Utah. Well, not that far. I mean, the visibility is pretty much next to nothing with all the forest fire smoke blowing in from California. Just kind of walking off trail now. Just trying to get up over that ridge line. My map showed a road, but alas, there is none. You know, earlier, everything was just green and lush, and forest and jungle-like, and now it's like the most dry, barren possible looking place you could imagine. I'm gonna drop down to this area here on the map. It's marked as the cove. You know, it sounds kind of cool. You take a place that's already dry and barren looking and you add this forest fire smoke and it just makes you look like a dust storm or something. I kind of feel like I'm in a Mad Max movie right now. I'm headed over to that pass right there. And as you can see, just in the distance, you see that mountain peak there, that's Wheeler Peak at Great Basin National Park. And it's just, just so fitting that it's right there in the pass and that's where I'm going, you know? Very cool. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the time of the day, this golden grass. I don't know, but 
This looks a lot better than it did coming down the, the other pass, dropping down into the cove. And this is just gorgeous. Really digging this. That's a beautiful sight right there. And Wheeler Peak and Great Basin National Park. Well, my next water source I have planned was a guzzler like up in the hills up there. I think it was like a 400 foot climb. And it kind of looks like there could be water down there in that patch of green. It would really save me a time and hassle. This was not on my map. It's not a marked spring or anything. Oh wow. Craig Spring. And perfect, there's a hole there to collect from. This is nice. So I'll say one thing about walking Nevada. You know, you see everything from a distance. You see the farms, you see the buildings, you see the highways, you see every approaching vehicle with its dust trail. But yet you feel invisible. You know, no one can see you up in the hills, just kind of looking out, watching everything. And you just kind of feel invisible to the world. Whoa, check this out. Just spring right in the middle of this road. I've never seen that before. Now this is the kind of spring you could just drink right out of. I mean, it's crystal clear. This is the source. I mean, even if something shit in the water, you know, it's just gonna get flushed downhill. I mean, this is like pure, pure water coming out here. This is amazing. It's a pretty surreal feeling to have my uh, end point in sight now. Been on trail for over two months. On one hand, ready for this hike to be over. I'm tired of climbing, I'm tired of bushwhacking. On the other hand, I'm not really looking forward to going back home and trying to piece together some sort of meaningful life again. You know, out here, I feel like I've got meaning and purpose, even if it isn't always enjoyable. Back at home, I just always feel like I'm kind of living life in between adventures. Well, this is camp for the night. Nothing too special, just uh, kind of sitting in the shadows of Wheeler Peak and Great Basin. You got all, I don't know, like three city lights from <laughs> Baker twinkling over there. You probably can't even see them. In fact, there's more light coming from that farm down there than there is the town of Baker. It's a hot night last night. It's actually kind of hard to get to sleep. Didn't even have my sleeping bag on me until like 3 a.m. or something like that. Well, today's probably not gonna be the most interesting day. I know it looks like I'm really close to these mountains, but I'm actually 22 miles from the canyon that I, I want to take. I'm going to walk the base of these mountains and then uh, take a canyon over there on the right and head up to the ridge line. And uh, yeah, it's 22 miles away. And I'm not really going down to the end of the mountains either. I guess it's just another example of how distances can be extremely deceiving when you're out in the desert. Last night I mentioned the feeling of invisibility I'll tell you one instance where that really comes in handy is uh, taking your morning crap. It was slightly awkward this morning, just kind of being out in the middle of uh, the open and you know, no cover really. I'm just looking down at the city of Baker and farms and the you know, vehicles going by on the highway a few miles away. And I know they can't see me, but I could see them. <laughs> Before I left home, I got my hands on a 
database of plane crashes in Nevada. I plotted out the coordinates of anything that looked like it was gonna be remotely along my route. And my notes say that there was a crash somewhere in this vicinity in 1967. Uh, it just says Piper, 1967. I'm assuming Piper is a small aircraft like a Cessna. And this is where my coordinates show the crash occurred. I don't know how accurate those GPS coordinates are. I have yet to see any debris or any sign of any kind of crash that occurred here. And there's a road like 200 yards that way, so it doesn't really make any sense that there would be a lot left, but you never know. This is Nevada. Now it's your turn. It's funny, animals get to make one sound. I make one noise, and I do it all day long. Well, it's about as good as it gets for a spot of shade in the desert right behind this pole. So on this pole here, there's a couple little pieces of metal, and this one says, flu rod. Okay, but this one's my favorite. This one says Cobra Rod. I don't know what Cobra Rod is, but it sounds pretty badass. <laughs> this pole is made with pure Cobra Rod <laughs> for rigidity. After doing a little walking off trail, I dump all the crap out of my shoes. Okay, Silver Creek Reservoir, private property, open to the public, courtesy of Baker Ranchers, Inc. Doesn't look like much, but I'm sure this is a place where the locals go and fish. So as I've mentioned before, on a through hike, you know, you've got a lot of time to let your mind wander. Today, I guess I've been thinking about, you know, names. You know, names of people and everything throughout history. You know, there's always been constants like Michael and David and Paul and things, and I think those have been around for you know, quite a long time and every generation kind of has like their own you know pool of names i guess that they that were very popular you know like 50 years ago 60 years ago you know bill tom richard those are probably some of the more popular names but now in the last 10 or 20 years for whatever reason there's just been this push to like make up all these new ridiculous names you know so in 20 years like you know, one out of every four adult men are gonna be named Aiden. Of course, we're gonna have all the weird variations of the name Aiden, like, probably gonna come out with like, Aidenton, Aidensley. You know, if you want something unique, how about you name your kid like Genghis or something, you know, like Genghis Khan. I don't know any Genghises. Now there is a crack on the lens. I can't tell if it's on the lens protector only or if the crack is actually the lens itself. So what I'm thinking is if I can get to the post office there today, I can get my bounce box, I can take the lens protector off and I've got a spare lens protector in the bounce box. I can inspect the lens, put the new lens protector on, be on my way. Now if it's a cracked lens, pretty much screwed, I'll have a hairline crack in the middle of all my videos, which won't be, won't be nice at all. I'll finally reach Highway 6 slash Highway 50. It's one of the main roads that runs through the valley. It's one of the main roads that runs through the state. And Baker's still several miles off in the distance here. It's such a long walk to get to somewhere that looks so close. Well, this is the town of Baker. Not a whole lot to it. It's only 68 people in this town. So I stopped at the post office, got my bounce box, and repaired my GoPro lens. I'm lucky it was just the screen protector and I was able to replace that, put a new one on, I'm good to go. So it would have been another 21 bucks for the post office to hold my box again since I opened it. 
so I made a hotel reservation for the day after tomorrow and had them hold on to it for free until then. And this is the gas station in Baker. They don't even have a convenience store. They just have that vending machine. It's like another five miles down this road. And then it's like another 12 miles up a dirt road to get up into the canyon. It's a great feeling to kind of have that finite uh, timeline now in place. You know, I've got to be done in 48 hours. That's what my hotel reservation is for Thursday night, so that's what I'm finishing. I'm finishing. <laughs> This is it, Great Basin National Park. Final leg of the Basin and Range Trail. Two months on trail for this moment. Let's do it. So from here, I've got a 2,000 foot climb to a campground at the end of this road, then another 3,000 foot climb on a hiking trail up to the ridge line. And then from there, Still another 2,000 foot climb to Wheeler Peak with a lot of ups and downs in between. So yeah, I've got 48 hours to go, but it's gonna be a brutal 48 hours. Well, I guess now all I can hope for is that the tree canopy covers the road a bit, provides a little bit of shade. It's just so hot. more cool rock formations in the Snake Creek Canyon, Hendry's Creek, Negro Creek, fallhead rock formations just like this. Well, unfortunately the creek alongside the road has dried up and I'm just hoping there's some sort of water source further up. Usually, you know, you get these creeks that, you know, if they're flowing at the top, they'll flow most of the way through the canyon, so it's kind of a gamble that it will be flowing up at the top. But I don't really have any choice. I gotta keep heading up. I've only got about a half a liter left. Well, today was a pretty solid filler day. I wasn't really expecting much out of it, and it certainly hasn't been exciting. I'm just hoping to basically knock out as much of the filler as I can, put myself in position, to tackle that ridge line tomorrow. And tomorrow will be my last full day on trail, which is actually kind of hard to believe that it just, you know, snuck up on me like that. But here I am. Serviceberry. Now that is a goofy name. Oh, Serviceberry. The Utah serviceberry shrub has been used for thousands of years by Native Americans. Yeah, and I'm sure that's what they called it too, service berry. Well, I'm all done with the road walk, and that's about four miles, 2,600 feet elevation gain to the lake. Off the top of my head, I cannot remember another bridge that I've encountered on the Basin and Range Trail. This could be the first. <laughs> Two months on trail, first bridge. Well, I feel a little stupid, but yesterday I put my water filter on backwards. It was pretty hot, pretty tired. I put it on like this, and now it messed up my gasket. The gasket is, is wedged in between here, and this thing's pretty much shot. So that's why you carry spares. So put a new gasket in there. It should seal her back up again pretty well. Get back to filtering water. I really don't like doing these 
big elevation climbs right before bedtime. It's only an hour before dark now. It's just kind of hard to go to bed when you're all hot and you got the blood pumping like that. I guess on the bright side, it'll be like 3,000 feet higher than where I slept last night, so it won't be so hot. Well, finally, I feel like I'm back in the high country. Well, it's getting pretty late now. I haven't seen anything flat or open uh, to set up a tent here, so I think first thing I come across looks halfway decent. It's gonna have to do. Got a pretty nice flat spot right here, right out in the open. I don't know what more I could ask for. Today's my last full day of hiking in Nevada on the Basin and Range Trail. If I can be honest, it gives me chills saying that two months of hiking about to come to a close tomorrow. I'm pretty sure this is a manzanita bush. You can tell by that red bark. I've got some pretty strong memories of bushwhacking through those. A couple scars to commemorate the experience as well. Really haven't seen these anywhere else in Nevada. And this is the old Johnson Lake mine. Back in World War I, this was a tungsten mine. And then after World War I, prices fell and places like this just became a, a relic. This one's pretty well intact compared to some of these other ones. It's got a, at least it's got a roof. Well, it's even got a modern window frame. Man, can you imagine having this for your morning view? Just looking out at this mountain. And this is Johnson Lake. This is the tram that's above Johnson Lake. This used to assist in the mining operations. And you can see like an engine down there. Here's another look at the tram. You can just see the cable go all the way up there. First of many climbs of the day done. It's gonna be a lot of ups and downs. A lot of great views, wow. One last view of Johnson Lake. Man, that is cool, that is impressive. So I'm up at about 11,300 feet now. There's actually a nice cool breeze for once. <laughs> Take that kind of thing for granted, being down in the desert. So I don't have all that much distance left to get to the town of Baker. Uh, just a lot of elevation gain today. So if I wanted to, I could end my hike today. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take my time, enjoy this last full day of hiking on the Basin and Range Trail. This is the ridge line I'm going to be walking all day. There's Baker Peak up there with 12,200 feet and then Wheeler Peak, 13,000 feet at the end. I was half expecting some sort of climber's trail, use trail, sort of faint trail 
up on this ridge line. Um, but so far it's basically just walking on jagged rocks. I hope it's not all boulders like this the whole way. It's gonna get a little tedious after a while. Kind of getting the feeling this is going to be a tedious boulder field uh, pretty much all day. That's Baker Lake way down there. And you can see out in the lake, there's like a yellow object. It looks like somebody's out on a little raft or something. Now that's the way to relax. Yeah, now I gotta find a way down from, from all this and keep going on that ridge line. Well, this ridge line's definitely a fitting way to spend my final full day in the Basin and Range Trail. Don't have that many miles to do, but I feel like it's gonna take a better part of the day. That's what you call a shoot of death. I just went through like a couple hundred yards of boulders where like every second or third one moved. You gotta watch every single step. And it's really weird how that like outer rock face is just crumbling away from that inner piece. It's like a, a more solid inner core. So it took me like two hours to go around just this ridge line here and get to this point. This is like frighteningly steep for these type of loose rocks. I was expecting there to be some sort of route along these ridge lines, you know, like some sort of popular route that people traverse all these, uh, you know, hit Baker and, and Wheeler and Mount Washington over there. There's, there's nothing, nothing helpful at all. Wow. This is one wicked ridge line. It's actually a bit easier to walk up here and skirting the hillside around it. All these rock formations are crazy. You just got like layers and layers of these spires. And the true depth of it isn't known until you just, you know, walk by from a different angle. What a fitting way to spend my last full day on trail. Just completely in awe of Nevada. I feel like I really did save the absolute best for last. Finally around the uh, all these crags and everything that uh, you know formed the cirque I guess of uh, Baker Lake if you were to look up at it it'd actually be pretty impressive from below that's the summit of Mount Baker up there man she don't look like much from down here
making the final push up to the summit of Baker now. Oh wow, well there's Wheeler. Time to, time to hit the summit of Baker. Wow. I think I'll call that one the forbidden selfie ledge. It's a one timer, man. You go out on that, you ain't coming back. Well, this is Baker Peak, 12,300 feet. And this is the fourth highest mountain in Nevada. Woo! Woo! <laughs> nice echo. Really echoes down that canyon. That's awesome. Well, next up, Wheeler Peak, second tallest peak in Nevada. I'm just gonna take this ridge line to get up there. First, I gotta get off Baker. And as you can see, it's quite cliffy. You see this sometimes in mountains, but man, this ridge line has been like very segmented. You know, there's all these like just huge drops in between these segments of of rock. Another one of these really narrow rocky chasms. I think one of the best things we've done as a country is protect our, our mountains. You know, these are special places. You know, we have so few places of this kind of magnitude that it would be a shame to not protect them. I mean, this place is its pretty slow walking as it is with the terrain, then you add scenic beauty and everything. And I feel like I'm getting nowhere today, but that's okay. That's what today is for. The north face of Baker Peak here is a sheer 1,500 foot cliff. It's said to be one of the highest alpine faces in the entire Great Basin, perhaps only overshadowed by the north face of its neighbor to the north, Wheeler Peak. Well, John Muir quotes can be a little overused and I guess maybe a bit cliche these days but there is one that I like and I think it's extremely relevant to through hikers and he says wander a whole summer if you can time will not be taken from the sum of your life instead of shortening it will definitely lengthen it and make you truly immortal and those words resonate quite a bit with me wander a whole summer out in a place like this and truly do feel immortal.
getting there. 400 feet to go. All right, now I'm getting somewhere. You can see the final summit. I made it up the majority of the ridge line, and I've just got a short ways to go to the summit block. Here's a look back at Mount Baker, Pyramid Peak, Mount Washington, and Mount Lincoln. And looking to the north is Mount Moriah over there. That's where I was a couple of days ago. And this here is the true summit of Wheeler Peak, 13,063 feet. Second tallest peak in Nevada, and the highest point on the Basin and Range Trail. Woo! Sixty six days on trail. You know, when I first got to Nevada, I remember looking out for my first high point like this. I'm just, you know, having the feeling of mystery. Now I look out at this land and I see memories. There's nothing quite like the culmination of a two month journey on trail. And here I am standing on Wheeler Peak on the final night, the greatest adventure of my life so far. Well, I guess now it's time to head down. Kind of a surreal feeling. Wanted this hike to be over so bad and now a little bit sad to uh, see it end. On this hike, I talked a lot about inspiration. And I think uh, inspiration isn't something that everybody grows up with in their life. It certainly wasn't for me. I didn't have any in source of inspiration as a kid. And I, nobody in my family, you know, accomplished anything, did anything in sports, did any kind of long trek like I'm doing, or, you know, just uh, some wildly successful business or a great adventure or anything. It was always just, work a middle-class job and support your family. And, you know, I never realized that I lacked that kind of inspiration in my life until I started developing that mindset for myself. I think that's one of those things that you just don't realize that you're missing in life. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very important component in your life. That's a view that just never gets old right there, looking back up at Wheeler Peak. Absolutely mesmerizing. And I would say to anybody that's never taken on a challenge that maybe, you know, feels like a little bit out of your league, you can do it, you know? Set yourself an amazing goal. Plan something outrageous. You can do it. Don't be afraid of failure. Be afraid of not realizing your full potential. Well, this is Stella Lake. This is where I'm gonna spend the last night on the Basin and Range Trail. 
I just walked around the lake and there's actually no campsites. I haven't seen any signs that say, you know, no camping or anything like that. The best I found for a campsite is right here. If I remove those rocks, probably have room for my tent there. No view of the lake, but what are you going to do? So I later found out that Stella Lake is a day use area only with no overnight camping allowed. Oops. Rangers at the visitor center in Baker didn't mention this to me when I stopped in. And after hiking over two months through the rest of Nevada, where there are practically no special regulations at all, I simply overlooked this. Honest mistake, but at least I can say I practice leave no trace principles. Day 67, my final day on trail. And there's a trailhead about a mile that way. I know if I walk over there, I'll probably get a ride back into town pretty quick. But it's pretty clear to me that I haven't really come to terms yet with the end of this hike. And I think I just need a little bit more time to kind of process things. So, the trail continues around this lake a little bit, and there's another small lake over there about a half mile away. And then there's another trail uh, that leads maybe six or seven miles downhill uh, to a road. And then from there, another seven miles or so road walk into town. And as funny as it sounds, all the walking I've done, I think it's kind of the best thing for me is just to uh, walk a little bit more today, give myself the time I need to process the end of this hike, and give myself the closure I need to kind of move on. This is Teresa Lake. More like a little pond at this point. And you gotta wonder how many more years we'll even have a lake. The way things are drying up out here in the west. It's actually quite odd to be spending some of my last few miles on the Basin and Range Trail on such a, you know, well-maintained trail. I haven't seen anything like this in over two months of hiking. Very unbefitting of the BRT. So I'm walking through Wheeler Peak Campground, which is actually closed for the 2020 season and they're doing some improvements, basically putting all these cement pads here. Well, it's a nice view for, for this campsite. Even if it's not a through hike, once you do backcountry camping, camping like this in these kind of campgrounds <laughs> really loses its appeal. Hiking over the years for me has been a slow progression, you know, started out doing day hikes, Overnight hikes, week-long hikes, did the Continental Divide Trail, and then I did this. And that just kind of leaves me thinking, where do I go from here? You know, how do you top this? Do I want to top this? It's questions I'm going to have to reflect upon and ponder when this whole thing is over. And one thing that makes, you know, finding closure a little bit more difficult on a hike like this is the fact that there's no definitive start or end point, like on the Continental Divide Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail. On a hike like that, you're walking from the border of Mexico to the border of Canada. 
and there's monuments. And out here, uh, things are a little bit more arbitrary. I started in the town of Ely, wherever I felt like it. And I could have made a loop and, and finished right back at the Motel 6 that I started it at. And that, that certainly isn't a, uh, you know, the monument that I think most people are after. And I chose to end my hike here at Great Basin. So I think for me, the symbolic end point is Wheeler Peak. The actual end point is the town of Baker. And here's some prickly pear cactus. You don't see a whole lot of cactus in Nevada, but I'm happy to report I've not had one negative cactus encounter on the Basin and Range Trail. I haven't bumped into one, I haven't accidentally kicked one. Seven and a half miles of road walk, and I'll be in Baker. Bone shifter, I like it. Uh, no matter how you slice it, through hike is full of adventure. But for me, I'm one of those people that never been satisfied doing things by the book, the normal way. It's a big reason why I created the Basin and Range Trail. Do my own thing, chance to truly explore, create your own footsteps, blaze your own trail, maximize your adventure knowing almost nothing about what the day is gonna hold. You know, can you make it down this mountain? Can you make it down this canyon? Is there gonna be water or not? And you just have to figure those things out on your own every day. And that's a true adventure in my book. And I'll tell you what, the Basin and Range Trail has absolutely lived up to my expectations of an unparalleled once in a lifetime adventure. That's Baker down there, just at the end of the hill. Still a couple miles out, but there she is, my end point. So before I get too close to town, I think I need to let off a little steam before people think I'm uh, a little nuts. Woo! My emotions are varied and intense. The truth is, I'm still searching for the words. <laughs> 67 days of Nevada. I've walked deserts to endless horizons, counted a lifetime's worth of stars, conquered some of Nevada's finest mountain ranges and walked with wild horses. I discovered mines, waterfalls, hot springs, ghost towns. I slept in a cave, found arrowheads, petrified wood, garnets, and other treasures. What few people I did encounter were eager to help me in any way they could, offering water, rides to town, hot meal, bed, and shower. And the outdoors has a way of bringing out the best in people and restoring my faith in humanity. And these moments did not come easy. I bushwhacked my way through hell and back, testing my sanity more times than I could count. I dodged lightning strikes, battled thirst and triple digit temperatures, blisters and sunburns, scrapers and stabbers, I finally earned my leather legs in the end. And now all this is over, I think the thing that makes ending this hike easier for me is not to think of it as the end of the greatest adventure of my life, but a stepping stone to an even greater one. And the original route I had planned was just shy of 1100 miles. I knew I wouldn't hike that exact route though, there are just too many variables and unknowns to draw a line and just stick to it. So the route I ended up hiking was 950 miles. This route now will undergo revisions and improvements, making for an even better experience for the next hiker, should he or she be willing to take on the Basin and Range Trail. No matter which route you take on the BRT, they all lead to the adventure of a lifetime. Basin and Range Trail, complete. Thanks for watching. I hope I've earned your subscription and a thumbs up. Visit basinandrangetrail.com for official maps and guidebook. Follow Seeking Lost on social media. 
and consider lending your support on Patreon if you would like to see more quality outdoor content.